Well, it's Palm Sunday today, and uh, it, it's possible that some of you um, saw the kids walking through with their palm branches. Maybe, maybe some of you uh, said, "Hey, you know that was really cute." And some of some of you may have been like, "Why do why are they waving shrubbery in my face?" Um, but the but the uh, story of Palm Sunday is much more than just watching cute kids come through waving palm branches. You know, to a person perhaps who doesn't know the story, that might be a little confusing. You know? And I'll openly admit that. There, if, if, let's just be honest with our Christian heritage, okay? Now let's just put it on the line. Some things that we do are a little weird, okay? If you look at it from an outside perspective, some of the things that we partake in, some of the rituals, some of the things that, you know, someone from the outside, someone who doesn't know what's going on, someone who doesn't know the story, if you tell them the story, hey, they'll appreciate the significance, and that's great. But, but if they don't know, they'll look at it like, you guys are kind of strange, you know. And Palm Sunday is, is one of those Sundays where the story... Is, is so strange that not even the, the folks who were a part of the very first one even knew what it was about. So, I think we, uh, I think sometimes we read scripture and we just automatically assume that everyone who has anything to do with the Bible or who, who are in the stories, oh, they know what's going on, you know, they, it's almost like they got they got uh, pre-warned. Okay, it, it's, it's as if they've read the script. And we, sometimes we picture the, the scriptural stories to be right before we read it. People are in the background. Okay, you stand over there. And whenever Jesus comes in, here's what I want you to say. And so we think about it as like this grand, glorious musical or play. Although we don't, we don't see many songs in here. Uh, but it happens. But actually, we see so many instances in Scripture where people would do something, and they would mean one thing, but they would actually not even know what's going on. So, in this particular story, we see an amazing outpouring of love for this guy coming through Jerusalem. Let me explain to you what happened to you. Jesus was heading towards Jerusalem. And this was going to be his last stop on his preaching tour, okay? And he had been healing folks. He had been preaching. We had just seen uh, not too long ago in the context of the story that he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. That just doesn't happen every day. And when something like that happens, and especially in this culture where anything that happens is automatically spread like wildfire among these little towns and, you know, everyone's related and all that kind of stuff, you know. They didn't have phones back then, so excitement of telling someone something would come in the form of running to the next town. And, hey, you got to see what happened. This is amazing. Like, this guy Jesus, he came and this guy was dead for four days and then he raised him from the dead. Yeah, they were good friends, so I think Jesus was like, you know whenever you have a good friend that works somewhere and you, you get a discount because you know them? I mean, that was kinda, I, I kind of feel like that was the feeling here, that, that Jesus had all the power of creation and raising the dead. My buddy Lazarus was died, so I'm going to go ahead and make sure he gets the benefit of this. That's not what happened, but sometimes you feel like that a little bit, you know? Like, hey, wait a minute, what about all these other folks? Well, you know, we see in Scripture that he did raise the dead a few other times, so he's not giving any special favors or permissions. Okay? So let's just get out of that, that out of the mind. So Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, and uh, the word spread like wildfire. The problem was the Roman guards and citizens and government did not like Jesus too much because the things that he would preach were countercultural to the Roman government. When we talked about how we are to regard each other, how we are to regard money, 
how, how, like, what kind of things he was preaching, like we're supposed to take care of the poor, we're supposed to love those with leprosy, all of these different kinds of things that Jesus taught that the Romans would say things like, uh, we're supposed to live, a good system would mean that everyone's living in luxury. Well, everyone that matters is living in luxury. That's what the Roman government, it was what we call a very, and this leaked into the Christian faith as well a little bit, uh, what we call a very Epicurean mentality. It was all about luxury. It was all about making us feel good. Living my best life, as we say. You know? And the Roman government did not like Jesus, but they tolerated him because he wasn't really doing anything that would hurt them or anything. I mean, he was gathering... You got to understand that anytime you start gathering a large crowd back in those days, you're at least going to be put on someone's list to just kind of keep an eye out, All right? So Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Wow, what an amazing miracle! This doesn't happen every day. Usually, you go to a funeral. That's the last time you see the deceased. You know? But these folks went to a funeral four days later. The guy's walking into a convenience store grabbing a coke. You know, I mean. This guy, this guy was didn't stay dead, you know. And imagine everyone, all the mortars who would have seen him walking down the street. Wait a minute, you look just like the guy that passed away a few days ago. And and I, we can I can preach on that whole story sometimes, but uh, some other time. But uh, it was you could just imagine the word word spread, you know. So the Roman government was really, started really getting upset with Jesus because he started gaining this large crowd. And he was declaring this countercultural proclamation that the kingdom of God is here. I am the kingdom of God. I am the king of the universe. You know, all of these de declarations that Jesus made had to do with him being the king over Israel, over the world, and this new kingdom was invading earth. You don't say the word invading in front of the Roman government. It doesn't go well for you. And so, you know, they're keeping an eye on him. Well, he is saying these things. Maybe he's a lunatic. Who knows? But... But let's just keep an eye on him. Then he starts gaining this massive following. Because he's doing things like raising people from the dead. And right before this particular story that I'm about to read, it says that the Roman government did not like Jesus because he was gaining this following and because he had raised Lazarus from the dead. It's funny, they, they actually acknowledge that, yeah, this is real. But... Um, Let's keep everyone away from Jesus. They did not like him because people were pledging their allegiance to Jesus. I don't know. I look at this now. I don't know about you. I look at this now and think, man, if someone's raising someone from the dead, I might go and follow them around. Try to figure out what their secret is. Hey, tell me your story. Can I get your autograph? I mean... All, all these kind of things that are going through my mind, why would you not, as, as the Roman government, as the, the centurions, as these folks who had great power and great wealth, at least give the guy the benefit of the doubt? I don't know. But right before this, they talk about the fact that Jesus was disrupting the norm. You know, the these folks, the, those in power, had everyone under control. This was during a time of a period of time called the Pax Romana. I think I've talked about this in the past. The Pax Romana was was this time period in which it was unprecedented peace, quote unquote, in the Roman Empire. And the only reason it was unprecedented peace was because <coughs> if you said anything against the Roman Empire, you were either thrown in prison or killed. So it kept everything nice and peaceful and docile. I can imagine that that would uh, quiet some people who were making a lot of noise. So they're going through their norm every day, collecting taxes, collecting more taxes, collecting too many taxes. 
And, and they would go through their days, you know, telling people what to do. Those who are poor, uh, stay, out, stay out of the limelight. Um, they also believed back then that as long as you couldn't see those poor folk, then you could still uh, propagate the propaganda that this is a we everyone's wealthy around here. You know. Come and join us. Join our empire. Uh, you know, come here so that you can be a part of this wonderful experience. And that's what they were inviting people to. They were inviting people to a, a place of pleasure, a place of luxury, this, this amazing this amazing region or empire and this new world that they were trying to create that you didn't have to rely on anyone else. The government, of course. But we'll take care of it. So when Jesus came pro proclaiming the good news that the kingdom of God is now, it's here, it's invading. But it's not looking like what you think it's going to look like. The Romans hated that because he was upsetting what they, the everyday, the norm, the daily. And can I just say to you that if Jesus is in control of your life, he's going to flip your life upside down. He's going to lead you into uncomfortable situations. And I think that we have um, given people a lie in our Christian culture that says that, hey, if you follow Jesus, you're going to have thousands more dollars. Everything is going to be easy for you. You'll never suffer again. And we, and we talk about this in Scripture that, that there, it's not anywhere in here. God does not promise easy. He promises abundance. So here we are, upsetting the norm. Jesus is coming in, gathering this large crowd. And it's amazing. He's doing all kinds of things for folks. And they realize that as he is doing things, that he, everything that he is doing is lining perfectly up who, with who Scripture says the Messiah is going to be. The Messiah was going to come in, was going to liberate everyone. That all you had to do was put your trust in him, and your life will be abundant. The Israelite people back in those days edited so edited slightly to say, oh, the Messiah is going to come in and he's going to take over the government and everything's going to be great because we will finally have won. If you look in, in the Israelite history during this time, there were many, many times of exile. There were many times of, you know, failed revolutions. There were many times in which the folks just tried to get their stuff back. God had promised them the promised land. They had come in and taken it. And then here comes yet another ruling power to deny them what is rightfully theirs. So here comes Jesus on his preaching tour, like I said earlier. He's coming into Jerusalem. And folks have already heard about him, and, they, and everyone is convinced this guy is the Messiah. The problem was they didn't know what it meant to be the Messiah. Messiahs ruled on a throne. Messiahs had lots of money. But they didn't know that that's not what Jesus was about yet. And then we come to this story. I know, a long, long foundation. But I want you to get in the minds of the folks that were there in the middle of Jerusalem, helping, helping you to understand what they were thinking, why they were thinking it, and it just seemed like uh, everyone had it wrong. So this has just happened, by the way, right after we've talked about Lazarus is raised from the dead. But right after that, um, Mary anointed Jesus' feet 
with oil. So we're starting in uh, chapter 12 of John, verses 12 through 19. The next day the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna! Blessed be the name, blessed be is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it. As it is written, do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this, and, and really no one did. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. They didn't get it. And we might say to ourselves, Well, the Pharisees don't get it. They don't understand that he is who he says he is. They don't understand that he is the, the king of the world. They don't understand that the kingdom of God is coming. And, and, and it's here, and it's now, and it's in our hearts, and it's around us, and it's beside us, and it's through us. They don't understand that, but the folks there that were laying down the palm branches and all of that, and taking off their cloaks, and letting him walk across, they didn't understand either. They were yelling the, this word, Hosanna, which literally means, save us. You know, they wanted, to, they wanted Jesus to come in if he is who he says he is, and don't, don't be another disappointing, quote-unquote, Messiah and not do what you're supposed to. He's coming in through the, through the middle of town. Everyone's cheering because finally, this is going to be the guy who will help us to win. Another account of this same story shows that Jesus, after he went through this whole parade, started weeping. Not because he was upset with everyone, but because they just didn't get it. They didn't understand that this Messiah was not going to take a sword and, and rush the capital. He was going to be he was going to be executed. This love that he was showing everyone, he was healing the sick, he was bringing the dead to life, he was preaching these things that gave people hope once again. He didn't, they didn't understand that he was not all about power in the sense that we think about it. That he was there to disrupt some things. To teach us a new way to live. To be our example. To show us that this life that we live is not just about us. And I think one of the most toxic things that we teach, and hear me now, one of the toxic things that we hear or that we teach sometimes as Christians or as teachers of, of the Bible is that the most important thing in life, don't take this wrong, I'm going to explain, is this personal relationship with me and Jesus. Just, just about us. Just, just me and Him. That's all it's about. As long as this is good, everything else, it doesn't matter. What, no, that is not what Scripture teaches. The devil wants us to cultivate this life that is just about us. The, the accuser, and after we do that, by the way, the accuser whispers in our ear, you don't care about anything. But what, what we see in Scripture is something that is much, much bigger than just us. It's this idea that God came, yes, for me, and we can have a relationship. And the fact is, it's amazing that we can even have a relationship with the, the one who created the entire universe. 
It's much more than that, though. It's about the hurting and the dying and, and, and those who are bleeding and those, those who don't have enough. And, and it's the fact that our lives, in, in order to follow Christ to the fullest of what He intends, Christ is going to disrupt our daily comfort zones. And there are some times where I don't get into the Word because I'm tired. There are times where I don't speak life into someone because it's like I, um, this is a millennial phrase, but because I can't even, you know, have you ever heard that one? No, anybody? Okay. And, do we just have a bird suicide back here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I get distracted. Um, but there are things in our lives that we as Christians, or we as any folk whatsoever, have created this, this buffer around ourselves so that our religion becomes more about keeping us comfortable than it is about passionately seeking His face on a regular basis. I, I heard a pastor say this uh, this weekend, that... So often we pray for God's blessings, but what we really need to be praying for is His presence. Like we want God to give us great stuff. We want God to make us comfortable. And we think for some reason, and this is all of us, I think, we think for some reason if we're doing everything right, then everything's going to go smoothly. And what happens is we're telling folks that. Because we're on this marketing scheme that, hey, you know, if you follow Jesus, man, everything's going to be great. Now, everything's going to be great, don't get me wrong. But what happens when that person encounters suffering, encounters adversity, encounters a disruption, encounters everything's been taken away, encounters... Uh, the, my friend died. Encounters, I mean, you just, you name it, you've all been through it. You know, they walk away. And I've got to tell you that yes, I mean, it's very tragic that they're walking away from the Lord and, and you know, I, I, we pray for them and we hope that they come back. But let us not get into the mentality that it was their fault. I mean, it's their, it's their own responsibility. I mean, we're all responsible for our own stuff. You know, don't, don't get me wrong there. But if I have shared with someone, hey, you know, join up with Jesus, you'll never have a bad situation happen to you again. What do you expect from the person? Jesus came to flip our lives upside down. And it's not so much because it's not so much because he just loves just disruption. It's because we have created a world around us that is flawed. And when you have perfection coming into a flawed situation, it's going to seem like perfection is upside down. It's not him that's weird. It's us. It's not him that's off. So we build into this system that we have, this idea that we either need to be doing everything flawlessly or God will not accept us whatsoever. Here's what... You know, I've preached on this passage many times in the past. I mean, it's not, probably to most of you, it's nothing new, and you've heard it before. But what else can we get from it? And, and, that, and honestly, as a pastor, that is something I think about a lot. I've, I've preached this many times. What else can I say about it? Any of us who preach, you know, that we know what that's like. The one thing I noticed. And this is, a, this is a long shot, this is a stretch, but just hear me out. 
That whether it be God coming to earth or God going into Jerusalem, that it wasn't us coming to him, it was him coming to us. You know, Jesus arrived in Jerusalem and he walked down the middle. And, and he knew exactly what was coming next to he knew that entering this town meant that he sealed his fate for being murdered a week later, less than a week later. He knew that the next meal he was going to have with his disciples was going to be the last meal he ever had. Well, in the flesh. You see, when we talk about the resurrection, when we talk about the crucifixion, we're looking at a situation that, you know, they were just going about their lives. The Romans were just executing another criminal in their minds, or at least someone who was accused. And, and really they were executing Jesus not because he was doing a lot of things wrong. It was basically just to get rid of him so that he wouldn't cause revolt, or so that the people who followed him would just kind of quiet down. And you would think that if you kill the leader, then the rebellion would end. But I'm here to tell you, it's been 2,000 years and we're still living in the rebellion. The world would want us to just embrace every comfort, every luxury, every pleasure. The world would want us to just toe the line, to do exactly what we're supposed to, and just live for ourselves. We are the easiest idol to set up in our own homes. The mirror. The doohickeys. Um, I'm not going to get into that, but I was going to talk about the phone and technology, but hey, whatever. I'm not going to get into that. Do we understand why Jesus came? I mean, we're all nodding our heads, of course, yeah. yeah but I don't even know if I fully understand. I mean, I understand the mechanics of it. He came, he loved us, he died, he was resurrected. I understand all that kind of stuff. But what I don't understand is why me? In the midst of what I've done, in the midst of what I've thought, in the midst of who I am, why me? I'm going to call the praise team up. Um, we're going to have a time where we share this last supper with, with Jesus as we prepare our hearts and minds for next week, the death, the resurrection, unify, this unifying presence of God coming to invade our hearts and lives. The idea of communion is actually something that is, it is still one of those strange things that we do, but it signifies this connection with each other, but also connection with other, every other congregation around the world that celebrates the same thing, and also every believer before and after. We're uniting with the centerpiece of our faith, and that's Jesus Christ, and this cross mentality. Kings don't die on crosses. That's the mentality. Kings have luxury and pleasure at their fingertips. But Jesus chose to go a different way. He chose to show his love through giving of himself. And he's asking us, would you just... Would you just embrace me today? And we're going to have a time here in just a moment where the ushers are going to come forward and they're going to pass out. I'm going to scoot this to the middle here. They're going to pass out the uh, communion elements. I just ask that you take them and hold on to them for 